So let's uh, continue with the final talk before lunch by Odette Gitzer from Boston University, uh, who will tell us something about oscillation-based models of speech perception pressing questions. Hello, everyone, and I want to thank to the organizers uh, for this great opportunity. I wanted to talk, as my title suggests, about uh, things that keep me awake at night, you know, <laughs> which are questions, you know, that I, that I, you know, need answers. So, um, oh, I don't have the, uh, so let me do it this way. Uh, I wanted to start with talking about um, the speech perception to, you know, again, I'm talking functionally. I'm a little bit, you know, away from uh, talking about neural data and all that. So I, I wanted to start with with my view of speech perception as a template matching mechanism. And if you, if I want to define template matching, the the vanilla definition is that uh, you know you need a um, a repository of templates. And then you do a search among those templates. And for the search, you need to define a distance measure. Now, you can talk, you can extend the vanilla and talk about dynamic templates. That means closed loop uh, you know, uh, processings. And they are in multiple time scales. And uh, for example, Grossberg's you know, adaptive resonances is an, is an example of that. Now, when you are talking about uh, you know, recognition, you need to try to narrow the search beam. How you narrow the search beam? You narrow it by segmentation or by content. By content means that you know something about the, you know, about the, the, the structure of the data. And um, an example in, in uh, systems, in recognition systems, are finite states machines, for example. That's the way they realize the notion of prediction. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, suggest, you know, a possible role of oscillation uh, that is in the realm of segmentation. But before that, just to talk about possible roles of oscillations in general. Uh, one role is to carry information across brain uh, areas uh, in different scales. And I th the way I see it is that if we consider this role, the oscillations are serving as carrier, which we, and the frequency of the os oscillation is rigid. And you can talk about feed-forward channel that is gamma channel, and we can talk about feedback uh, channel, which is in the beta domain. Another possible, uh, another role can be to chunk information. So the oscillators are stimulus driven, and they are synchronized with the input, and they are flexible in nature because the stimulus doesn't have to be, uh, you know, rigid. Uh, yet another possibility. Uh, is maybe involving in the decoding process. And yet another uh, possibility, uh, which is a, away from, from the scope of what we talk about, is mechanisms of working memory, like E.D. Hart and uh, Lisman, for example. The theta is part of the, of the circuitry. So talk about, talking about segmentation, I suggest an axiom. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm suggesting that segmentation is a, pre a prerequisite for effective decoding. Without you know, having a good segmentation, you will not have a good decoding. So, so again, if I'm wrong in that, then I'm in trouble. Now, syllabic segmentation, uh, we use theta. Uh, you know, we use the theta to define what I call theta syllables. You know, even phoneticians will tell you syllable in the acoustics is not well defined. I don't know exactly the boundaries. But if, you know, you use the cortical argument, you can talk about theta oscillators that are much more def well defined. 
And what this, this is pretty much, uh, you know, um, we, are, we are happy with, with this um, interpretation of, of theta, with the work we did so far. Uh, but you can talk about prosodic segmentation, uh, and uh, you can talk about, and what we do when we talk about, um, you know, prosody, um, is to use in, in our community is to use uh, uh, isochronous stimuli, and those create some oscillations that are in the delta domain, and I will talk about it a little more. Um, and those, I, I would argue, are anticipation driven, and are not at all uh, content driven. Uh, we can talk about acoustic driven delta. And those, I think, are more appropriate for everyday speech. And these, and here I will talk a little bit about some preliminary uh, evidence that I gathered on that psychophysically. Uh, and in that, in, in, in the context of everyday speech, I think we should ask ourselves, what does it mean, content invoked segmentation? When, when, so so I, I don't understand, you know, the logic of suggesting content invoked segmentation. And so uh, you need a window to guide the decoding process, and the oscillations in different time scales provide that window. Within that window, you do the decoding. So in theta segmentation, there, was, there is this pre-lexical tempo. It is a functional model uh, with awareness to biophysical constraints. It has a decoding path. You have the, uh, the periphery, bunch, you know, array of envelopes. Let's say that's the cochlear output. And then it goes into a template matching box uh, that is, you know, the decoding the, the, uh, the uh, object, you know, and gives you VCV object in this case because, uh, uh, you know, the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to it in a moment. And this is something that conforms to conventional models of speech perception. That's what we talk about and, and used to talk about it for, for, for decades. What we added here is a segmentation path. The same output goes into a theta, inside the theta nested gamma, and those are the windows that guide the template matching process. And if the acoustic cues that drive the theta are, are uh, vocalic nuclei, for example, then you can talk about a theta cycle that is a VCV. And those are the objects that are coming out from the decoding process. And for, for that to work, you, you talk about the theta that is a special kind of oscillator capable of tracking the input rhythm in the following sense. If this is speech, and this is some sort of a aggregated signal coming out of looking at the modulation spectrum of the cochlear output, you know, the peaks are defining, you know, the the markers for the different thetas. And it is a flexible theta because it is changing from one cycle to the other. And I'm thinking PLL in terms of mechanism. Uh, and the VCO tracks the input instantaneously. PLL for phase lock loop, VCO for voltage controlled oscillator. Now, the decoding can be done like that. You know, you have the gamma cycles nested inside the theta, and they are built in. And you are just decoding instantaneously, and the code is generated, uh, released at the end of the theta cycle, for, like that. So when the theta cycle ends, you are transferring the, 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 the decoded the code further up, and so on. And we showed that this kind of a code is invariant to time scale modification. That means that the code 
is consistent for different time scales as long as the theta, as the oscillator, is locked to the input rhythm. Whenever, and, and, and indeed, you know, the, the, the uh, theta range is within the, the capability of, of, of decoding speech accurately as a function of speed. What I mean by the code is that if you look at cochlear output in those frequencies, and those are the envelopes of them, and here are the bumps below, you know, two kilohertz belonging to the vowel, and here are the ones belonging to the fricatives, like what Peter was talking about. Uh, then if I repeat that and look at a particular cycle, the code is, is the sampling of the envelopes across all channels. And that idea was actually implemented by what Elise was talking about earlier this morning. So what is the role of theta? The role of theta in this paradigm is, uh, you know, with, with this kind of, of, of thinking, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can talk about a, a model that is insensitive to time scale variations. This is going one step towards explaining phonemic variability. I think it is a nice property. And we need for that a structure that can breathe with the input. You know, the moment you lose synchronization, you lose performance. Uh, a question comes, does it have to be oscillation based? Can we, because it's not a regular oscillation. Uh, and uh, uh, if not, what kind of alternative mechanism we can suggest? I don't know of that. That's why I'm stuck with the oscillatory model. Um, now, Nancy Coppell has now two students, two postdocs that are working into biophysical models that will realize phase lock loop function. But it's not a phase lock loop, but rather biophysical model for that. Uh, can we observe a flexible theta? That is what Peter showed, I think, today. You know, if you run to a monkey, you know, a woo 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 like that, you know, you are, you know, you see that it can trace, you know, instantaneously. Uh, I, I, that's at least what, one thing that we want to, um, to um, establish in that study. Now, how about the role of gamma? So insensitivity to time scale variations require that the gamma cycles uniformly spread across the theta cycle. Then we have a nice representation, a nice code. Uh, but how this is reconciling with the observed excitability regions? That means what, what happens in the, in, this, in the part of the theta that it's not excitable and we don't have gamma cycles. So we need to adjust the model here. And that's something that, uh, uh, that UA uh, is working on. Uh, is the, is, is the, is the, um, the, 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 the gamma driven by the acoustics, or is it part of the circuitry? Uh, because unless uh, circuit, uh, you know, the gamma is driven by the, by the modulations in the gamma band, but Note that, that it carries very, you know, small amount of phonetic information. Uh, and finally, do we need a theta buffer or is it a, um, in an ongoing encoding? Uh, and lastly, I want to, you know, to, to bring Eti Chang's eco data that shows gamma correlated with features, acoustic phonetic features that he finds. So it's a very interesting thing to, to, to follow. So from now, I would like to move to theta delta segmentation and to start with the notion of sensory prediction or active sensing. So in that framework, the, uh, the assumption is that brain is engaged not only in generating language patterns, but also in predicting time window that the input is more likely to, to occur for the next, you know, for decoding. And 
cortical oscillations have been suggested to be involved in, in, in implementing this mechanism. In particular, the idea is that what happens now within the current theta is going to dictate the next theta, the next window, in a perpetual mobile motion, kind of, for, for analysis. Uh, and uh, one, you know, seemingly a supporting um, uh, study of that view is what uh, Nye did, where he showed peaks in the, in the uh, you know, cortical domain that are not confounded by acoustic or prosodic cues. So you have peaks in the syllable level, if you have an input like that. You have peaks in the corresponding um, phrase and, sy and syllable level, if you have something like that, or this kind of peaks when you have sentence structure. Uh, so what those peaks tell us? And uh, 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 I suggest that they not necessarily tell us that there is a cortical tracking that provides segmentation but rather it is an indication of information transfer. That is when a syllable, you know, have, you know, stopped, you know, was decoded, it, it is moving from one area to the other, and we have an energy here. And if, if a phrase has been de decoded, while it is moved to another area, you, you have the indication. So those are, um, uh, you know, those are periodic in this particular study because the input is isochronous. Every word is coming in a very, in, a, in atomic clock kind of fashion. Now, if this uh, interpretation is the case, you can ask what is the segmentation mechanism for that? And I suggest that the segmentation is uh, coming because of the um, because of um, some sort of anticipation, you know, when you are in and and the, the and the question is, what mechanism can we think of in terms of anticipation-driven delta? I don't know what kind of uh, circuit uh, can it be. I have no idea, but that's a question, and it has nothing to do with content because these kind of signatures are going to be the exact same signature no matter what the content, the, the linguistic content is of the stimulus. So uh, um, another question, of course, is, is it connected to what Lars was suggesting that goes to parsing, which is in distinction from the segmentation? And this view reinforces a role of acoustic-driven segmentation for everyday speech now. Uh, so I want to, to just pose a question. Is, can we think of acoustic-driven delta oscillator as prosodic marker for everyday speech? Uh, the model that I suggest for that is that if you, to, you look at the pre-lexical tempo here, here are the VCV objects and they are going to a word recognition stage. There is, the acoustics also drives an acoustic-driven delta, and, and the delta marks the boundaries, you know, when to stop integrating the words or the phrases that are coming by integrating the VCV objects. And you have here a feedback which is driven on carriers, like what Bastiansen is suggesting. You know, if the beta keeps being high, keep integrating. The moment beta goes down, stop integrating, for example. So that's the thinking, but of course it has, it's just preliminary. Now, acoustic segmentation in the delta band is um, basically to take an analogy to the, uh, you know, to the um, theta, to the syllabic level. So you assume 
delta chunks, multi-word in duration, uh, and uh, we, you generalize the mechanism of theta segmentation to the delta range. An acoustic-driven delta, if it is going to be successful in terms of uh, performance, uh, performance is going to be high as long as the delta is in sync with the acoustic chunk rhythm. But you need to have, in the auditory channel, in the output of the cochlea, for example, uh, robust cues that a delta oscillator can be locked onto. What are those cues uh, uh, still remain to be seen? Uh, and you assume a phase lock loop type of network on the delta domain now. Um, so, um, I did some work uh, to provide psychophysical evidence for that in this work. Uh, and the focus was in acoustic segmentation. Basically, uh, four questions have been were asked, uh, is acoustic segmentation plays a role in word retrieval? Uh, I will skip now the second question. Uh, the, the data that I was playing with was this data, uh, digit sequences, digits because of the fact that I, I want to remove content or context out of the picture. So you think, you talk about digit strings, and this is what you hear. Three, three, two, three, four, four, three, well, for some reason. Uh, for the time, for, for the time's sake, I will skip, you know, the, the, you know, playing it again. But basically... Three, three, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, five. So those are the, the, the stimuli that uh, the, the uh, uh, listener is uh, listening to. And, um, you know, there were a question that was also uh, looked at. Uh, uh, if indeed segmentation is important, are oscillations involved in it or not? Uh, so, uh, the, the, the test was, you, list, you know, the target identification paradigm. You listen to the 10-digit strings, and this is followed by a target of two or three digits, and all you have to do is to say if the target is inside or outside the digit string. And what we showed uh, is uh, that Irris irrespective of chunking patterns. We tried it with different chunking patterns. What you heard is the American way of producing digits, but you can do it in French way, in, in, a, in a European way, in other ways. Uh, we show that no matter which pat chunking pattern you use, it's important that you will first segment, you will, you know, that the, 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 uh, the, the target will be inside the chunk. And I will not, uh, you know, go beyond uh, uh, just to go here and to say that if you are speeding up the chunking rate beyond the delta range, you have a sharp drop in performance. So it's, it suggests that you should be within, the chunking rate should be within the delta range uh, uh, for good performance. Uh, so... Uh, I wanted to say something about the role of prosody in communications, but I don't have time for that. It was a video that I about two toddlers communicating with prosody only. But we don't have time to look at it. So let's move to acoustic cues for prosody. Those are um, traditionally, uh, you know, accentuation arcs across the chunk. And uh, people are saying the duration of, vo of vowels, for example, uh, mel melodic contours, intensity are important cues for, for acoustic segmentation. 
Uh, and um, the questions are how to extract these acoustic terms and how to integrate them into some robust input into a phase lock loop in the delta range. Those are questions that I'm, I'm posing. Uh, one possibility is to look at modulation spectra in the delta band. Uh, and this is work in progress. I just wanted to show you something that I did and, uh, and the frustrations that I have with that. 105-865-8263. That's the sentence. You apply some algorithm on it. Uh, in, you, know, you have the cochlear gram here, ignore. And you have here the blue line, which, uh, which the peaks of it uh, are the indicators of the, of the theta uh, markers, and the red line where the dips are the indicators of the delta. And you see that the delta indicates the phrases, and inside you have the, the theta cycles. This is neat and nice. It works with this stimulus as well. 337-781-2554. You see how it nicely segmented it? So, but if you now go to a sentence, it's easy to tell the depth of a well. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Uh, you see how this, this cue gives you prosodic windows or markers that are not according to what we perceive phrases to be. So that is a challenge, you know, if indeed, uh, you know, we use acoustics for delta segmentation, uh, 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 that is an issue. So what mechanism, we, I will finish with those two slides. Which mechanism indicates the end of a word or a phrase of a sentence? You can talk about acoustic driven centric approach where you talk about bottom up oscillators. They must be flexible and they are locked on accentuation arcs. You can talk about sensory predictive centric top down oscillators they are rigid by definition uh, and in all linguistic levels. So I think it, it's, it's going to pose a problem in the context of everyday speech. Uh, tempo sets a segmentation role of rhythms by setting up a window to narrow the, the, the surge beam. But most common assumed roles for rhythms is multiplexing. Uh, so Basically, that enables communications between different areas in different uh, uh, time scales. In, 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 in the syllabic scale, the, the, the objects are transferred at the end of theta cycles in the words, you know, and, and the same with words and phrases. Finally, role of oscillations in decoding. This is something that I think uh, is an issue. Are oscillations involved in coding, in decoding? In the syllabic, uh, uh, you know, level, uh, we have that model, you know, the gamma sampling of the envelope. Uh, but what happens in the word level, in the phrase level? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in that sense, the gamma and the beta, I should say, serve as carriers uh, in, with fixed frequencies of the carriers, where the gamma carrier carries prediction error information and the beta carrier, you know, carries prediction in code, sort of, the way that, you know, Bastiansen was suggesting to tell us when to stop the integration. So, in that I finished my questions and what bothers me in terms of, you know, what is it that needs to be answered in much further details. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions. Ah, N Nancy. one from the rim. Sorry. Oh. First question from the rim. Hello. Um, thanks. I'll try to promote a bit of theoretical linguistics to the business class. Um, so if you can go back to your last slide. Um, so I, I think the, the general motive of my question slash comment is that 
I think we're pushing oscillations a bit too far sometimes, forgetting you know, all kind of um, other top-down knowledge that's there from linguistics, for example. So say this first bullet that says, you know, part of a decoding circuitry at a syllabic level, I mean, I can totally see how that semi-regular signal, you know, is decoded by an oscillation. But I wouldn't see the reason for pushing that same mechanism for like to a word level, because unlike that semi-rhythmic signal that's there at the syllable level, at the word level, you know, unless you are a lucky Chinese speaker, you know, you have variation of length, right, from monosyllabic to bisyllabic, trisyllabic to longer, let alone phrase level where that variation is even less predictable, right? So I'm just wondering why do we even push that mechanism to... I agree with you completely, okay. but I still, you know, it's still in the back of my mind with, with some time I'm going to bed. Maybe we miss something, I don't know. I, I believe, you know, I, 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 I uh, you know, the, you know, I'm with you on the same wavelength that in the word level and the phrase level, I don't see a role for oscillations. Yeah, and I think, you know, what we see in Ding's paper is we see a, um, we see a very nice measure of, you know, that looks like potentially oscillatory activity, although it doesn't have to be. But the syntactic structure there is chosen in a very clear, idealized way, right, such that it can neatly be packed into those two word phrases, right? But, you know, I guess everyone, like the authors would agree that probably, you know, they, they've chosen that ideal case in order to see the marker, but should you kind of move away from idealization? Like the mechanism, I mean, you're not looking at the mechanism, we're looking at the marker, really. Anyway, that was, um, I guess, a comment. Um, but I, I guess the question was about, you know, the, um, Sorry, am I allowed all this time? Yeah? Okay. The question was about consonants and vowels. So in the first part of your talk, you were talking about making vowels, you know, the setters for the um, theta cycle. Mm -hmm. And maybe I, I thought maybe um, we can merge a bit your insight with the insight from like Peter Lakatos' talk who tried to have this dual encoding, you know, at the consonant and vowel level. Because I think if we go back like 10 or 15 years, like a typical, you know, speech perception study would show you that if you give, especially like, you know, a CV syllable that starts with a stop consonant, that does have a very strong evoked response, right? The N1 response. So would there be any room at all, uh, you know, to kind of combine the strong, you know, evoked responses by those acoustic edges mm -hmm. with the more oscillatory based, you know, in, uh, entrainment from mm -hmm. the vowel mm -hmm. centers? Well, you know, this is something that, again, is, is a lingering, uh, um, you know, question that David, for example, and I have. Uh, I am fully aware of the edge is a very prominent uh, cue, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning, David and I were talking about edges driving the oscillator. But then, what happens in the presence of noise? The edges disappear in the cochlear output. What is island of stability in noise are the vowels, are the nuclei of the vowels. And that is why personally, as a digital signal processing guy, I like that better. And finally, I think David and I agreed that the only way to dissolve this, uh, and I don't think David disagrees, I mean, we, but, but the issue is LFP. Peter can help us with that. Is the delta locked to vowel nuclei, or is the delta locked to C into V boundaries in noise, for example? Only LFP will tell us what exactly it is, because both are correlated, you know, it's the same theta cycle. But the question where it sits, you know, and, and is it VCV or something, or, or something that is a little more complicated? So the only reason to suggest or to prefer the vowel from functional viewpoint is that, that, that those uh, edges are not there in noise when we still perform great in terms of intelligibility. But the lack of energy is present still, right? Even in noise. In the pre you know, you don't have the boundary usually. Nancy. So in a sense, this follows up the theme that you brought up about being sometimes too entrained to our theories, that we tend to use um, 
concepts that have come out of theories that <coughs> shape our way of thinking about things. And I was very taken by a statement of Oded's right near the end of a talk in which um, he said that gar uh, gamma carries prediction errors, whereas beta carries prediction coding. And I immediately started thinking of Carl Friston and immediately started saying, uh-uh. <laughs> and, and, and just in what we've talked about so far, um, and, and certainly in, in what we're going to hear later from, uh, from Marcel, um, we see that gamma is not just about prediction errors. It can be about prediction errors. It can also be about um, just simply there's a signal, something, something happens, and when there is a prediction, the gamma can actually get larger. Uh, what do you mean by something is happening? Something. You, you say a word and there's a gamma in some part of the auditory cortex that's a consequence of the fact that you said something. Yeah, but what is the function of that gamma? That's the, that's the question, so, right? Yes, it is. But why do you think of it as an error? No, no, I'm not... Look, I, I, I don't want to, to cut you, but, but, but I think what, 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 you know, it occurs to me the past few weeks or so, is that, you know, the com our community uh, kind of divided in interest. You have the acoustics and the, the way acoustics influences speech perception. And now I understand what David said, and you have language comprehension issues that I think, to large extent, disconnect from speech per se issues. And I think that speech, we should, and oscillatory models that use speech, I concentrate on segmentation, not in decoding, because that is what I think acoustics will help you to put together the windows. How the decoding is done in there is something that, that we don't have any idea. I don't think it is oscillation based, but but the language people don't care about that. They say, okay, we just got the word, we just got you know, the syllable, and how we are now going to integrate across words and so on and so forth. This is somehow disconnected from speech. So when you say gamma, you can think of the gamma being on the language comprehension domain, where okay, while you do... In this context that I'm thinking of the gamma in the comprehension domain, that's Okay, right. okay, and, and then, you know, the way, the way I heard the community talking about is that it is a carrier that carries information about the error. Okay, and this is exactly what I'm complaining about. Okay. That is, um, certain ideas propagate through our community and need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a primary one. Mm -hmm. What the notion of an error is, what the notion of a propagation of an error is, is something that's very much up for grabs. And also what, what the notion of a code is and the propagation of the right. code backwards. So I'm gonna say a little bit about that in, okay. in, in okay. my talk too. What are we doing? Thank you. Hey. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I would like to get a clarification on uh, the distinction you made between uh, theta and delta entrainment. Also, this distinction has been brought up earlier by the, in David's talk. So it seems that you restrict the predictive nature of entrainment to delta entrainment, uh, and you relate that to the active sensing theory. And in my understanding of the theory, uh, uh, like this, is, uh, the, um, this theory stipulates that uh, in the presence of temporal regularities in the stimulation, the brain will follow will entrain to these uh, regularities in order to optimally process future events by predicting the timing of these events. So you can imagine that, well, indeed being the case for delta entrainment to process cues, but you should also observe that for theta entrainment to syllabic information. So why would, you why would there be a distinction between these two entrainment mechanisms? And yeah, wouldn't both relate to 
well, temporal predictions. Uh, unless I didn't understand you, uh, I actually think it's the same mechanism. I suggest to, oops, I suggest to generalize the mechanism of the theta to the delta. Uh, yeah. That's what I suggest, but it is not on, on, on it is not on a feedback, you know, fashion, but rather feed forward. The um, there is a certain well, I don't know the English word bringschuld. Is there such a word in English? Well, uh, and you bring shield, the bring shield um, <laughs> that we have. So, in the case of just to I mean, pick up on, on Anne's point to some extent, that we owe some work here. In the case of the work on theta, regardless of what our interpretation is, we have a pretty nice body of work that we can. That's almost like a proper linking hypothesis between the physics of speech, because the modulation spectrum cross linguistically is very regular. Uh, the nature of theta oscillations and the range over which they operate, and a feature of linguistics, namely mean syllable duration across languages. So we have a very neat alignment of physics, neurophysiology, and linguistic interpretation. That's why we have a story that's emerging and we can fix you know, the parts. In the case of the Delta work, it's quite different. I think that's raised by Nina and to some extent by Anne as well. We don't have an alignment or we don't have a linking hypothesis between the nature of delta oscillators, the nature of you know, prosodic phenomena at that range, and linguistics that can, you know, so we still owe that. I mean, Laos has some preliminary data on that, but we simply don't have the links that establish that solidly to have some mechanistic story the same way we have it for the other case. And that's something that I think should be um, brought out more in our but talks. In, but in spoken language, in the spoken language community, you know, they keep talking, and I'm, talk I'm thinking Ann Cutler, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Philippe Martin. You know, people are talking about stress uh, profiles. They talk about vowel durations as markers for, for uh, you know, for phrases. You know, so, so we don't know, I think, how to translate the way, you know, the hand-waving of that importance into systems that will extract robust acoustic cues, like we do with the vowels, for example, in the, in the syllable um, domain. I think that's really, I mean, you are raising the linguistics perspective, and it's really, for me, a job for linguists. I mean, I know that for word length, you have these statistics, histograms of word lengths, right? And you see that they're clearly um, non-uniform there's a peak in the histogram of word lengths, and we know it's related to information content of the word. We don't know whether that's related to a wavelength or something. And the same thing hasn't been done in linguistics for phrase length, you know? But I did it once, you know? If you draw just a histogram from a tree bank over the phrase length, it's not uniform either. You also have a peak. It's an F-shaped distribution, and there's some sluggish kind of peak in there, which sits within the delta range, yeah? But no linguist has really looked at this, like quantifying phrase length, word length, and relating that to wavelength. It's not been done. And that's really something I think that the linguists should be doing. So linguists in the room, just draw yeah, this to like, and Like you. Yeah. Uh, OK, I think that's well, actually wait, wait, wait. Let me just say one sentence to make the people aware of this database. I think it's important. Mark Lieberman published a database that I think is very telling in that context. He looked at George W. Bush speeches and Obama speeches, and then he looked into speech silence, you know, speech silence and statistics of that. They all fell inside a delta range. Let's go have lunch. Thank you.